Well, welcome to our messaging, the message, the what? The service, uh, the conversion class, yes. My, my brain went like, <laughs> all right. Well, it didn't freeze, it went in different directions. This part's going over there and the other one's going over there. Anyway, yes. <laughs> the teaching ministry of Harlingen Messianic Synagogue. Uh, and this is our eighth and final conversion class. And next week we will begin studying the Tree of Life. Um, so we ask you to read. Um, it's, Matthew is about the kingdom, but it's not just about Matthew. We're asking you to read, to look up in the Besorot, in the Gospels, where every time, every place where it says kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And we'll be talking, so we'll be talking about those things next week. All right, so in this final class, we want to discuss what is the place of women in the synagogue, all right? So we're going to talk about that. What is the, what is the place of women? Um, and I want to start off with this. We entitled this, Why No uh, um, Breed Me Law for the Woman? Why No Circumcision for the Women? Um, and it's not so obvious as you would think, because particularly in Islam, there is female circumcision. Um, and so it, it's not as, as far-fetched a thing as one would think. But in Judaism, no. It is only the man who is circumcised. Only the male is circumcised. Um, so we want to... We want to look at this. We want to take this apart and look at it. For example, why is it that the man usually brings home, it is the man who brings home flowers for the woman, for the wife, but the wife usually does not bring home flowers for the man? There's a reason to this. There's a psychological reason to this, a physiological reason to this. It has to do with, with your makeup, the, with the way you're made up. There's a reason why a man will bring flowers to, to a woman he appreciates, but the woman does not bring. Why is it that the woman, the wife, will, will buy her husband a tool, a saw, something like that, a tool, and he's all excited, he can't wait to use it. But the man buys the wife a vacuum cleaner, and she's horrified. How could you, you know, as a gift, why, how could you, you wrap up the vacuum cleaner with bows and ribbons, and, and the wife is horrified, how could you do this? There's a reason for all of this. And if the wife would understand, the husband, and if the husband would understand the wife, then there wouldn't be so many arguments and things would run much smoother and everything would, would work a lot better. Okay, so I'm going to tell you the why. I'm going to tell you why. Do you know why the wife is horrified when the man brings her a vacuum cleaner as a gift, but the man is excited when the wife brings him a saw? Okay. The reason why, the, and the wife is like, the wife is to the man when she brings a vacuum, when he brings her a vacuum cleaner as a gift in a box all wrapped and, in, you know, and he's expecting for her to appreciate it. Because the reason why he does that, that's what he would want as a gift. He's simply buying for, he's simply buying for her something that he would want. In other words, what? A man wants a tool that will facilitate what he's doing. Men appreciate tools. So like the favorite places for a man to go is Lowe's or uh, a building supply store, something like that. Can't get them out of there, man. They're just wandering and they're not even, they can't even buy it. I don't go to Lowe's because it's depressing for me. I, I can't afford it. Okay. I, I mean, I, I love what's there, but, but I can't do it. And so I walk in, and I'm, I've got all these ideas. I could do that. I can do that. But cash is, a, cash is an item 
and uh, they won't let me walk out of there with items for free. So um, I, I prefer just not to go. Um, I don't want to depress myself. Uh, but so this is why, uh, uh, you know, un ladies understand this is why the husband buys you what he buys you. He's not thinking like a woman. He's thinking like a man. And so he's buying for you in the, in the manner that, that he wants. In other words, he's treating you the way he wants to be treated. He's not putting you down. Oh, in the women's, they're like, great, another thing for me to do. He's telling me I need to vacuum. The, you know, he buys you a new washing machine. Great. He wants me to do the laundry. No, you're missing the point. He's buying for you the way he would want to be bought for. He's buying you the tool that he would want to have if he were you. And that's, and that's the way you have to look at it. Why is it that he's the one who brings home, why, he, why the male brings to the female flowers? Why is it that the male brings to the female candy, sweets? Hmm? Well, maybe. He wants to share. No, there's a reason behind it. There's a psychology behind it. This is coming because the man is of the earth. He is earthy. He's earthy. He's of the world. He's literally, man is from the earth. He's taken from the soil of the earth. Understand that Cain brought to Hashem those things which he did with his own hands. And this is a very typical male thing to do. The reason why the man brings the roses, brings the flowers, is number one, because the woman will appreciate the flowers. But number two, it is as though he's saying, I raised these flowers myself. No, he went to H-E-B and he bought them. Okay, but he worked to earn the money so that he could buy this extra, this something special. So to a man, the time is valuable because this is the way he stays alive. And particularly in, in uh, the, the, the male mindset, the limitation of time is, is, is very much in the mind of a man. The time limitations of life are very much in the mind of a man. Not so much in the woman. And so to, to the man, his time is very valuable because it's very limited. Where, and, and speaking not, not so much today because the mold has been broken, sadly, the mold has been broken. Because in generations past, people get, well, will get upset with this, but it's okay. I can take it. I got broad shoulders. The woman's place was the home. Her responsibility was the raising of the children. The man's responsibility was the keeping of the children as in the provision for the children. This was the man's responsibility for the provision of the household we are wired this way. This is the way God created us. He does not tell the woman that she will work by the sweat of her brow. He tells the man, you will work. Adam, you will work by the sweat of your brow in order to provide bread for your household. He tells the woman, your suffering will be in child rearing. Your burden will be in child rearing. And from this in Judaism, we have the distinctions that the woman's position, responsibility, is that of the household. It's not, it's not a lower responsibility. It is a different responsibility, and we have got to understand this. The man's responsibility was the provision for the family, and this usually entailed him going out and working in the fields. This usually entailed him getting up before the sun 
and going out because remember they didn't have all the equipment that we have today and even today I mean I, I live on a farm and they come there the, the tractors are going by before the sun is up but he's out there excuse me already doing the back breaking work of planting and keeping and harvesting the field. Do you know where we get the idea of an acre of land? What is an acre of land? Where did the measurement of an acre of land? Now you can get, you can, there are, there's a specific, I don't know what it is, there's a specific measurement today of what an acre of land is. But the whole idea of an acre of land, one acre was the amount of land that a man could plow, could plant, in a single day. That's what an acre is. One acre would be the amount of land that a man could plant in a single day. And so if he had five acres of land or ten acres of land, then that means that's how many days it would take him to till that soil. Every time he would have to go through that, it would take him 10 days to start at the beginning of all the way through to the end. I grew up on a cotton farm. We picked by hand. And with four or five of us working at a time, it would take us a week to pick through four acres of field. It would take us a week to, to pick four acres of field. And when we got to the end of it, the next week, you start again because it's, the cotton's con constantly coming out. And so by the time you get to the end, this side of the field's already started again. It's already reproduced again. And so all summer long, you pick for the week, and you go back to the beginning. You pick for the week, you go back to the beginning. You pick for the week, you go back to the beginning. Genesis, brace sheep. Chapter 2, the story of creation, the continuing story of creation. Verse 21 says, Adonai Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall on the man, and he slept. And he took, God took, one of Adam's ribs and closed up the flesh in his place. Now, let's clarify something right here to begin with. Man is not missing a rib because God took one of Adam's ribs, all right? That is not true. You're not missing a rib because God took, that was a story that went about back when I was growing up, you know, well, man's missing one rib over here because God took one of the ribs to create Eve. Not true. Adonai Elohim built the rib which he had taken from the man into a woman. Then he brought her to the man, and the man said, This one, at last, is bone of my bone. Now, all of this happened in one day. What does he mean, at last? What does he mean, at last? That the time that he had to go, what little time he went through without woman. And remember, he was created when? At the end of the sixth day. Ka'adam was the last, the ultimate creation. He was the very last of creation. And he was created at the end. As soon as he was created and God breathed into his breast the breath of life, Shabbat started. So man's first day on the earth was a day of rest. How about that? How would you like your first day of work and your boss says to you, you know what, you need a vacation. His first day of work, his first day uh, uh, of creation, his first day of existence is Shabbat. But in this time period, God pulls woman. And so he calls her Isha. His, he is Ish man. Say Ish. Now Adam Adam is also man, but Adam means from Dam uh, 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 means from the earth. Okay, so Adam means from the earth, but Ish is is man. So uh, when when he Adam is the word that we would translate human. 
but Ish is the man. And so he called her Isha. He called her Isha. Isha, out of man. Because she was taken out of man. Now, in Kabbalistic thinking, you'll see how this goes. That when God first created Adam, he created them, male and female, within a single being. So when he created Adam, both the male and the female were within Adam. Why? Because the scripture says, because it says in this creation that he created him, he created them. He created him, he created them. And so the Chassal tell us that this is telling us, this is revealing to us that Adam was made, and this is why he pulls Isha, he pulls Chava out. Because Isha is within the male. Adam is created with all of the attributes in full force. All of the sephirot in full force. When he pulls Chava out, he pulls out with her the right side of the tree of life. He pulls out from her the right side of the sephirot, which we'll get into when we get into the Kabbalah next week. So this is a good segue, eh? And what is that? That is machut, yesod, um, um, gevurot, chesed, chen. So all of these, the, 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 the kinder, the sweeter, the, the, the softer aspects is what he puts into the female, into the one who's drawn out. And he leaves with Adam, he leaves with the male, the, the judgmental ones, the justice side. Which is why, in the family, the father is the disciplinarian most often time, and the mother is the caregiver. The mother is the gentle one. The father is usually the more strict one. So usually, when we were growing up, our mother just had to tell us this when we were misbehaving, wait till your father gets home. Because she would not take it upon herself unless it was really serious business. She would not take it upon herself to discipline us. She would leave the discipline up to dad. Not that she couldn't. But she had that softer side and she knew that dad would be more down the line, more strict about it. And she knew that we needed that guidance. We needed those, those, those um, curbs, those bumpers, to keep us on the straight path. As we have discussed before, too much of the judgment side, and you're going to mess up your child. Too much of the mercy side, and you're going to mess up your child. You need the balance. This is why he created them male and female. This is why he pulled, he pulled the, the, the chesed side, the mercy side, the kindness side out and gave it to the woman. This, by the way, it is a psychological thing. Understand this. It's a physiological thing. This is the way we are created, that the man is more aloof to situations and circumstances than the woman is. The woman seems to be more in tune to circumstances, to situations. She is more emotionally invested in the situations. And the man is more standoffish. The man is more away emotionally. And in fact, until the recent generation, this was very much so. Men did not cry. They did not. Now, they did cry, but they did not want you to see them cry. With the exception of a man's wife and perhaps his daughters, 
he did not use the term love. And some of you still have that problem today. I know because I will tell you, I love you, bro. And you're like, yeah. <laughs> I love you, bro. Yeah, well, we'll see you later. <laughs> this is the physiological aspect of a man of, I want you to be close, but not too close. We're bros, but, you know, keep your, keep your distance. I remember when we used to, when, we, when I was growing up and we used to walk down the sidewalk with, you know, I had my best friend on this side and my other best friend on this side and we all had our arms wrapped around each other and there would be five best friends in a row taking up the whole sidewalk. But suddenly we grew up and you don't see that unless they're drunk. <laughs> and then it's like, I love you, man, right? It's not like... <laughs> They're all crying and weeping. Why? Because the alcohol releases the true emotion that's within the man. But this aloofness, this coldness, is built within the physiology, the makeup of the man, of the male. Where the female is emotionally invested. Her emotions are involved in all of the situations of life. And it's not that the man can can it's not that the man can can help his aloofness. And it's not that the woman can help her emotionality. This is why women cry when they do. And it seems to the man to be so much, well, why do you cry all the time? When you're happy, you're crying. When you're sad, you're crying. When you're okay, you're crying. You cry all the time. But, it, but you see, it's not a bad thing. This is the way we are made. The woman is made with this emotional instinct within her with which she is in contact. Not control, but contact. The man has this aloofness to him. Once again, not under his control. This is our physiological makeup. This is the way God created us. What you are seeing is the tree of life in effect every single day of your life between the female and the male. You're seeing the justice, the judgment side being set off with the kindness side, with the chesed. And the plan of God to draw the woman out, but then to bring them back together because the two working together in harmony is what creates a good family. And that's what it's all about. Judaism is about creating good families. Why? Because what is the first command that God gives to Adam and Chava? Be fruitful and multiply. For this reason, for this cause, a man shall separate himself from his mother and his father and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall become, and they shall be fruitful, and they shall multiply. You see, God's whole intent from the very beginning is about the family. This is why so many times, this is why when a man finds his true helpmate. They never separate again. That's why in such situations, there is no divorce. Because what has happened with Wilma and me, she's the one that God took out of my side and stood her next to me and said, bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh. She's a part of me. We are blended together. And in such a blending, how do you, you know, can you, can you take the Kool-Aid out of the water? Once you've blended it and the Kool-Aid is dissolved, can you take it out? 
The Kool-Aid is different from the water. But once they're mixed, they're mixed. This is also why when you don't find that one, it doesn't work. You're not finding the yin to the yang. You're not finding the positive to the negative. You're not finding the, op the opposite effect. You're not finding, the, you know, in, with magnetism, with electricity, what attracts, opposite attracts. And you're not finding that. So, why is it that there is no female circumcision? The woman is not required to be circumcised. In fact, other than tevila, other than immersion, she's required nothing as far as these things are, as far as conversion is concerned. In fact, do you know that the woman is not required to attend synagogue? It is the man who is required to attend synagogue. The women come voluntarily. The man is required to attend synagogue. The woman is not required to attend synagogue. In today's society, particularly in more liberal Jewish societies, you see the women wearing kippah. And you see the women donning tzalit and putting on tefillin. Now, is there anything wrong with this? Yes and no. Yes and no. The thing about it is this. The woman is not required. Nor is it a mitzvah when she does so. Can she? Yes. The consideration is why. But even with the why, even if she's answering a why in her own personal life, it is not counted as a mitzvah. In other words, in heaven, it is not looked upon as being a good deed. It just is. So there's no reward for a woman wearing tzitzit. There is no reward for a woman uh, uh, wearing tefillin. That reward goes to the man. Because it is a mitzvah for the man. It is a command. It is the man who is commanded to do these things. The woman is not commanded. Now, the woman is commanded to cover her hair. The man is not com com commanded to cover his hair. Now, I cover my hair as a, as, a, as a signal to myself, as a reminder to myself that I am under the authority of God. The reason why the woman covers her hair, as is explained to us, is that she is under the authority of her husband saying there are certain things about a woman that a man is not supposed to see. And one of them is her hair. If you go to the Middle East today, if you go into an Orthodox community today, Orthodox, or you go into an Orthodox Muslim community today, one of the things that you will notice is that the women have their hair covered, particularly those who are married. Why? Because hair has an attraction to the man. So you cover the hair. There's a rule which you can follow. In order to be, in order to be, to be, what's the word I want? Modest as a woman. The parts that you do not want a man to be thinking about, to be seeing, to be thinking about, are to remain covered. And all of this goes back to the physiology, the makeup, because a woman does not think like a man. And women are not attract attracted to men the way men are attracted to women. And the reason is because when God pulled Chava out, he pulled out a spiritual being. Remember what I told you? Adam was what? Earthy. He is of the earth, she is of the spirit. This is why throughout all societies, all societies, whether it be in, in Christianity or whether it's in Judaism or whether it's in Islam or Buddhism or whatever, all societies, 
The woman is the more spiritual. She is the more religious of the couple. I can remember growing up. It was the women who were in church. The men, they were out starting the barbecue fire. They were out starting the barbecue fire. While the women and the children were in church. Our church was close to Pendleton Park, right over here. I mean, like two blocks away. And we were on the west side. So, west side, yeah, no. We were on... <laughs> We were, we were, we were on, the, on west side of, of Pendleton Park saying what? That the wind's blowing out of the east across the park. Back then we had, it was a wooden building, an old Methodist church building. And we were Baptists, but we had purchased the building. It was an old wood frame building, no AC, nothing like that. The windows open almost all year long. So guess what is wafting in in the middle of Dad's message, in the, in the middle of Dad's sermon, are these barbecue smells coming from Pendleton Park because the women and the children are in the church and the men are getting the barbecue ready for lunch. The reason why the man wears the talit, the tzitzit, is because I need to be reminded the woman does not need to be reminded she's already there she is the emotional side she is the spiritual side the man is the physical side and the mental side and he might be mental he's the mental <laughs> side I need to be reminded. So God said, okay, let me help you out. He does not tell the woman, he tells the man, you know, you need some strings hanging down, some memory cords, right? You tie a knot on your finger to remind you. Hanging down, some fringes hanging down. Where do the fringes come out from? Where do the fringes come out from? the waist. Where do we wear them? Here. Why? When a man is zipping and unzipping his pants, what does he see? The fringes. I'm a holy man. And I must maintain this body in a holy way. A man who is wearing his seat seat will have a hard time having an affair because before he can have an affair, he must get through the tzitzit. Remember to do all of my commandments. Remember that sin is as idolatry. Remember that immorality, that adultery is idolatry. Thus, to keep the man from his idolatrous ways, God fastens upon him cords to remind him to whom he belongs. You are fastened by that cord to heaven above. Ladies, you do not need that. Because you are already created as the spiritual being. You are the ruach of the family. This is all of the comparison of Rav Shaul. That the husband is like the Mashiach. That the woman is like the ruach, the Shekhinah. You're the Shekhinah of the home. But what is the thing about the Shekhinah? She's the one who brings the light into the home. It's not the man. It's the woman who brings the light into the home. You're the ones who lighten the home. So that when the man is coming home, he sees the candle in the window. And he has within his heart ah, that feeling. You know, man, when you drive up into the driveway, your home. 
Now today, it's a little more difficult to distinguish, but you know, back in those days, the man would come home and supper would already be cooking or on the table by the time the man would get home and he would, he would approach as he would approach the door of the house and the wife would open the door to welcome the husband in and the smell of supper would be there and the man would be home. <laughs> You're the spirit. You're the Shekinah of the home. And you're what keeps him coming back. If we want Mashiach, we must have the spiritual aspect in place. If you want Mashiach involved in your life, if you want Mashiach to keep coming back, you must have that spiritual, you must have that candle burning in the window. You must have that supper cooking and set on the table so that when he comes knocking on the door and you know what he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will let me in, I will come in and I will dine with that person and that person with me. You are the Shekinah. You're the bride with the door open waiting for your man to come home. You don't need the reminder. You are the reminder. Do you know who I go to when I need spiritual advice? My wife. When I'm troubled, I go to my wife. When I'm enthusiastic, I go to my wife. When I'm alive, I go to my wife. When I'm dying, I go to my wife. Because she's the light of the home. She's the spirit taken out from within. But you see, this is why you must understand the distinction of the sexuality of man and woman. We are not the same. We're not created the same. We don't work the same. And today's society is trying to mesh everything together. And it doesn't work. Because we're not created that way. This is why Rav Shaul says it's against nature. It is unnatural. You're trying to make something work that doesn't work. And the, the whole aspect of this is the ver this very idea the union between, between male and female is the reunification of the physical with the spiritual. You see, when God took Chava out of Adam, he took the spiritual out of the physical. But now the connection is to put the physical and the spiritual back together. But as a duality, as two human beings, not as one. Because when a man thinks, he thinks in physical terms. This is why a woman, for the most part, is not attracted so much by the man's physique as he is by his strength and his courage. This is why you can see the most beautiful woman on the arm of the ugliest man in the world. <laughs> I'm not talking over here. <laughs> I'm just playing with you, brother. <laughs> this is why. You, you sit there and you, you say, bro, how did you do that? How did you score? The woman is, the, 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 the man is looking at the physical aspect of the woman. This is why the female form, the female figure is such an anathema. This is the downfall of the man. 
this is why the woman is to keep herself covered in in a modest way so that I cannot see your shape and your form. This is why, by the way, in the Middle East, even to this day, from all the way back from the beginning, from Bible days until now, in the Middle East, the women wear the, the, the shawl, the burqa, as it were. And it's not just the Islamic woman. The, everybody at that time wore that type of clothing to keep her body shielded from the eyes of men. By the way, women, don't wear short, cropped clothing. And then fuss at the man because he's looking where you have shortly cropped it. That's hypocrisy. You're showing to him what you, don't, what you claim you don't want him looking at. Why are they always looking down here when I'm up here? Well, then quit showing me down here and I'll look up here because I'm going to look at what you're showing me. Now, I'm, just, I'm telling you the truth. This is the, way from, this is the way a man thinks. A woman does not think that way for the most part. Now, she, can, she will have that kind of aspect. I'm not saying that it's not there but it is not the heavy aspect of her sexuality. Because her sexual formality, her, her, her sexuality takes form in, in emotion. This is why a man is instantly, can be instantly triggered where it takes a woman time. We're created differently. And it comes from the fact that the man is created out of the earth. Therefore, he is of the flesh. And he must be constantly reminded to achieve, to attain, to aliyah, to climb to the spirituality. For the man, it is an extreme struggle to climb to the spirituality. For the woman, she's already there. She's already built that way. She's built with this already inside her. It's not always a way, but it's there. So ladies, you are spiritually more in tune. This, by the way, 1 Peter chapter 3. People get upset because of this scripture. If I can get it. He tells the husband, be careful with your wife. Live with your wives, he says. This is in 1 Peter 3 and 7. Live with your wives in an understanding way. Saying, don't make your wives cry. You be careful with your wife. You don't break her heart. You do not break your wife. You be careful how you speak to her. You be careful how you act with her. You be careful how you treat her. Oh, I'm not a dainty rose. I'm not a, you know, I'm not a daisy that's going to wilt. Except you are. Inside. You can put on a tough exterior, but your physiology, the way you are created and put together by God himself, says different. says, why the tears? You are the emotional aspect, the spiritual aspect of humanity. Men, you must recognize that. When we speak to our wives brusquely, shortly cut off, 
with that aloofness, with that coldness. When we speak down to them, when we insult them. Because the truth is, women are just as intelligent as men. Sometimes more intelligent. Because we're from the earth. And we're physical. And they're attached to the spirit. And sometimes we just don't get it. And when you hear women talking amongst themselves, that's one of the same things. Say things they frequently say about the man. They just don't get it. Well, there's a reason why we don't get it, but it is the, the ministry of the woman to help us to get it. But men, understand that you are at a shortcoming. You are at a disadvantage in these things. And though it is not your fault that you are physical in your physiology, in your makeup, Neither is it your wife's fault. She is, as you are how God made you, she is how God made her. When we speak to our women with disdain, with the, with the, with that, that looking down upon them, with the curtain, with the with the with the the, the, the sometimes the, even the meanness. Every word that I speak to my wife in such a way crushes one of the petals on the rose. And before too long, I can have crushed all the petals. And there's nothing. And the woman becomes an empty shell, simply going through the motion, simply going through the existence of living with this man for the sake of the children. This is where all of this comes from. Now, this is, I understand this is a broad generality, and it's not exactly the case in every case. But you see, secondary to that is if you go to the top of the chapter, it talks about the submiss submissive woman be submitted to your own husband. Oh, that's such a horrible thing, especially today. Heaven help us, I'll probably be canceled. Do you know, women, that you are a witness to your husband as to the power of God without ever saying a word. He says, by the wife's conduct, without a word, the man may be won over. Without saying a word. Why? Well, we spend a lot of time, we The female spends a lot of time over her beauty. The beauty parlor, the spas, the nails, the face, the makeup, all of these things. I'm not putting you down. Don't misunderstand me. I thank God for that. Sometimes I thank God for that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Speak for yourself, brother. <laughs> I don't do it. <laughs> Women, he says, don't let your beauty be external. This is not your true beauty. You see, <laughs> we all grow old. And gravity has its effect on all of us. And those things will soon fall. And you'll have the wobbles. What do I mean, the wobbles? You know, the wobbles. I used to, when I was in second grade, I had this 
she must have been like 70 years old, this elderly teacher, my second grade teacher, Mrs. Donaldson, and she had the wobble pen. That's what we called it because she would write on the board and it would go like this. It would shake everywhere. This is the problem, by the way, this is, this, this is the problem with getting tattoos. Because you get that tattoo, what's it going to look like in 30 years? <laughs> by the way, I've got the wobbles. That's why I wear suits and long shirts all the time. Because I'm there. You get the extra chin. If you didn't start with them, don't worry. They'll come along soon enough. And soon, soon you, look like a, you look like a turkey under here. Right? No, 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 no. The wobbles. If all of your focus and your attention is on this, understand that this does not last long. But you know, you can have a sweet spirit when you're 20, when you're 30, when you're 40, when you're 50. You can have a sweet spirit when you're 60, when you're 70, when you're 80. I love my wife more today than I did when we first got married because of her sweet spirit, because of her kindness and her compassion. Now, there are some denominations and groups that say, well, you see, you can't be braiding your hair. You can't be wearing gold. You can't be wearing, you know, you can, don't be wearing jewelry. Don't be on all this kind of stuff. That's foolishness. You are allowed to make up. Don't, under, don't take what I'm saying and twist it all around. And don't take what Kefa says here and twist it all around. Yes, you can wear makeup. Yes, you can braid your hair. Yes, you can do these. You can wear nice clothes. That's okay. That's great. That's wonderful. That's awesome. Just understand that's not you. You are what is inside. Instead, let your beauty be the hidden person of the heart with unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. That's what attracts the man. You want to get a man's heart, ignore him. <laughs> you think it doesn't work? It works. If, if, if you, the quiet treatment works on a man like nothing else, because he begins to wonder within himself, what in the world have I got myself into? Now, don't, don't use the quiet treatment too often. <laughs> but understand that the woman who is loud and brash, the woman who's out there displaying everything, drawing attention to herself, she is drawing attention to herself, but not from the right kind of man. And she is drawing attention to herself, but not for the reason she wants. Because even though she is being that way, she is being earthy and she's being physical and all of that, at the heart of herself, of her true self, she is emotional and spiritual. Therefore, she's being untrue to herself. And she's only going to get the animal instinct of the man aroused. That's it. And that does not last long. It does not last long. You remember the story of Tamar, the daughter of David, who is raped by her half-brother. He wants her, and he wants her, and he wants her, and he begs her, and he pleads with her, whatever. And he finally, one day, he, uh, he, he places himself in, a, in the sick ward so that she'll come in and take care of him. And he begs, and he pleads with her. And she refuses him. So he grabs her, and he rapes her. But after he has raped her, what does he do? He throws her away. He's had his way with her, and he's done. This is what you see in relationships all the time today. That is the vast majority of relationships today. Women understand that a man is working, is coming from an animalistic level. 
he is. That's why, you know, the women say he's such an animal. Sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad, but that's why it comes from. Because it's the truth. Because we are of the earth. We are earthy. We are physical in our nature. When a woman exposes herself, she draws that instinct out of him. She's drawing the physical instinct out of him. But the physical instinct is short-lived. And after a man has had his way with this woman, he's done with her, and what? He's off to the next one. This is why these things happen. It's all just the flesh. It's all physical. It's all just the physicality of it. It's all the endorphins and the, and the, 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 the drugs that are in your mind when you're, when you're having sexual relations. That's what's going on with the man. So that the more a woman reveals of herself physically to the man, the more the man becomes attracted to the woman. This is why the woman is to keep herself covered, clothed, with everyone except her husband. And even with her husband, she is to maintain her modesty. That is, she's not to just be walking around the house naked all the time or whatever. Why? Because one day he gets used to all of that. That becomes old hat to him. The mystery's over. The mystery's done. And the animal instinct will tell him it's time to go on to something else. It's time to go on to find a new mystery. So that even in the home the woman is to remain modest and covered, except at the most intimate times. The woman is to have a gentle and quiet spirit. And he says, verse 5, for this is the way of the holy women. Of what? The holy women. Saying to be otherwise, is to be unholy. This is the way you separate yourself. So the reason why the woman does not need to do all these things is because she's already got the connection. It comes in her makeup. It's simply a matter of acknowledgement <clears throat> and getting and tuning it up. For the man, it is a different matter. Yitzhak had to climb. We talked about this last night. Yitzhak had to climb himself up onto the altar to draw close to God. Men, we must climb our way. We must claw. We must fight our way up onto the altar. In order to draw close to God. It's a fight for us. Women, more naturally, will read the Bible and will go through the prayers and will do these things than the man will. The woman usually does not need to be reminded to read her Bible. The woman does not usually need to be reminded to pray. But the man needs the seder, the, the siddur thrown at his forehead. And the tefillin wrapped around his arm and his neck, his head. So that God can drag you in and say, remember. This is why it is that physical member of the male that is cut. It is a reminder. 
It is the excess flesh that is cut off. The excess. Not that it's wrong. It's just excess. So women, be spiritual. Stay spiritual. Men, our spirit can be crushed. Concerning the Rosh HaKodesh, Rosh Shaul writes this. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, Let no harmful word come out of your mouth, but only what is beneficial for building others up according to need, so that it gives grace to those who hear it. Do not grieve the Spirit of God by whom you are sealed. You're the Shekhinah of the household. Men, understand this, that he's talking to you concerning how you treat your wife. Do not let any harmful word come out of your mouth towards your wife. But only what is beneficial for building her up according to her needs. So that it gives grace. When do you get the most beautiful flowers? After they've been watered and fertilized, they're taken care of. You want your wife to be a beautiful creature to you? Then treat her like the beautiful creature she is. Treat her like the, the, the prized possession, the treasured possession that she is. Do not grieve the spiritual aspect of your family. Because if you crush it, what happens when you grieve the Spirit of God? Where does the Shekhinah go when you grieve it? It doesn't take much for the Shekhinah to be Get up and go. Ichabod was written across the door of the temple. Emptiness. Because the Shekinah was grieved at the children of Israel. And she got up and left. It took her a long time to do it. But she did. So Closing, what is the woman's part in conversion? You're already mostly there. You just be fine too. Acknowledge you. It is the man who needs to climb and fight. Don't be fighting and climbing like the man. Thank God you don't have to. Thank God you don't have to. Because the man sitting next to you is sitting there wishing, I wish I was more faithful to God. I wish I would quit messing up. I wish that I could remember to read the Torah, to read my Bible, to remember to pray. I wish I could remember. And so God's tying strings on me. And cutting off parts of my skin, my flesh. And wrapping leather straps around my arms and my head. Because I can't remember to do these things. I forget. Can you wear a kippah? Yes, you can. Can you wear tali? Yes. Can you wear tefillin? Yes. But there's no honor in it, and there's no reward in it. Because it's not a mitzvah to you. It just is. man who 
have to do it. You can see it from the earth. He's earthy. He's physical in his nature. And in order for him to draw near to God, he must climb onto the altar. his holy God. Did it with your clothes. motives for for taking these steps, Father, and having an understanding, Lord God, of of who you want us to to be, what you want us to do, Father, for your honor and for your glory. Spirit, bless us over the rest of the Shabbat today for each and every one of us. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.